Thank you for joining me for my ramble about QR codes. Um, I'm Felix, I'm a third year CSE student. And before I start, I should probably say a lot of this is inspired by a very cool blog post that I saw a few months ago and decided to make a talk out of. So go and check it out after. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you know what a QR code is, uh, especially if you've lived through the pandemic, you've probably seen them everywhere. This is a QR code, this is a QR code, this is a slightly bigger QR code, this is a much bigger QR code. This is a massive QR code. So there's lots of different QR codes out there and you can scan it with your phone. You can, I don't know, look, look at a menu in a restaurant, do whatever you want with it. Um, this is a particularly cool QR code or set of QR codes that I saw quite a while ago. And I thought, hmm, how do we make this? But first of all, before I go through that, let's talk about the structure of a QR code in general. There's a few things that you have to have in there. Uh, so there are lots of these different alignment marks which are used uh, when you scan a QR code to determine where each bit of it is. Uh, there's information about the format and version of the QR code because there's lots of different versions. And then the rest is just data that you can fill in with whatever you want. Uh, going back to this massive QR code, some people, as you've probably seen before, they do something like this, where they put an image over the QR code to personalize it. We're not doing that today. Um, but you can do this for certain reasons, and that reason is because of error correction. So QR codes use an error correction scheme called Reed solomon Error Correcting Codes. Um, and to be honest, it's a lot of maths, and I don't really want to go through it, and I don't really understand it myself. So I'm going to sort of give you some of the main takeaways that you need to know for QR codes. Um, what we have is we have some input data. We feed it into our Reed solomon error correction thingy-majig machine, and what we get out is our input data with an error correction code appended to the end. So it's what's called a systematic code. So you can see the original message in the encoded message. It's just got the error correction code appended to the end. And another good property of it is that it's XORable. So if we take two messages that we want to encode and XOR them, and then do the Reed solomon error correcting, it's the same as if we do the error correcting first, then XOR the output messages, and we get the same thing, which is a really cool property. There's a few different ways of encoding things in QR codes. Uh, first of all, there's an alphanumeric encoding scheme, which uh, averages 5.5 bits per character. It's a really weird thing that the company that created this specification made up where they decided they want numbers, capital letters, spaces, and these particular punctuation marks. Don't know why they chose those ones, but either way, they created some random encoding scheme that uses 5.5 bits per character. Um, then we've got, we can just encode binary data, so what is effectively extending the ASCII into our, into our QR codes. That uses 8 bits per character, as you would expect. Um, there's also an encoding scheme which only encodes numbers, and we get a bit more efficient if we do that. So it encodes three numbers into uh, blocks of 10 bits. And finally, it's a Japanese company that invented them. They also have a kanji encoding scheme. Um, and what's interesting about QR codes is the way that we actually put our data into the QR code isn't sequential. It doesn't just go along. What we actually do is we start in this bottom corner. Uh, we start with this bit, and we kind of snake our way up and down around when we're writing our data in. So we start in the bottom right-hand corner and work our way to the left. There's some steps to creating a QR code. Step one, we want to encode our data. Uh, step two, we compute our read solomon error correction code. And step four is that we write the data to the QR code. Uh, obviously, there is a step missing there. And that is that we need to mask our data first. So sometimes cameras that we use to scan QR codes are a bit limited. They, uh, you know, sometimes in a QR code, you might accidentally create some alignment marks, which makes it very difficult for the camera to actually be able to align the QR code properly when it's reading it. So what we do is we choose an appropriate mask that we want to put over our QR code to eliminate those patterns, and then we XOR the entire QR code with that, and that is what makes a valid QR code. Um, here's a picture of some cool patterns. Uh, these are all of the ones in the spec. Um, obviously, you're supposed to choose the one that um, works best to remove the patterns that we don't want, but in reality, you can just choose your favorite. So. We need to prepare some data to draw on our QR codes to get the cool pictures in, like I showed you. Um, and what we should kind of start with is a link. So you know, a lot of the time when you scan a QR code, it's to get to a link. So we want to make a link, but then we need to add a load of data to the end of that that looks like a picture. Um, but we can't really do that with the text encoding, because obviously ASCII, that there's, a, there's a lot more codes than there are valid characters that can be in a QR code. So if we were to just put a load of data at the end of a link, um, it would come up with loads of null characters, and we don't want that. Uh, we've also got this numeric encoding that we talked about, which encodes 0 to 9 in 10 bits, and almost every combination there is valid. You can encode 
anything up to 999 and, uh, out of a possible 1,024-bit streams. Um, and so there's very little invalid data that we can have there. Um, and remembering that when we have a URL, you can put a hash at the end of it and a load of numbers, for instance, and then that will go to an HTML anchor with that number, and if it doesn't exist, it will do nothing. So we can create QR codes that have a hash and then a load of numbers at the end, um, and it will still be valid and go to the place that we want it to whilst looking cool. Uh, obviously, the, the main problem there that you're probably thinking is that, obviously, uh, the link encoding is different to the numeric encoding, but luckily the QR code spec just lets us smush two different encodings together. Smush being a, a very technical term, obviously. Um, but we, we can just do that, which is really neat. So let's now go through how to make a better, cooler QR code with a nice picture in it. Uh, first of all, we want to encode the start of our link that we're trying to go to with a hash at the end. Uh, and as you can see, we've written that from the bottom left towards the right. Second of all, we XOR the image that we want to put in and write that in. So I've used the checkerboard mask on this. Uh, third of all, we calculate the read Solomon error code and stick that at the end. And then finally, we un XOR, uh, effectively XORing twice. And this is our final QR code. And if you scan that right now, you'd find it goes to our website. Uh, but obviously, looking at this, it's slightly different to this. This looks a little bit more messed up, but also the picture that is put in is a lot wider. Um, so can we get our image to actually be bigger? Yes. The thing is, I don't fully understand how it works. There's a lot of it linear algebra involved, but um, essentially, by doing things like putting it into our echelon form, we can uh, manipulate single pixels in our QR code and essentially combine different re Solomon blocks together to create exact outputs that we want whilst still being a valid code that decodes to what we want. Uh, and then many lines of linear algebra later, we get something like this. And that is all. Thank you. Any questions? Oh. Yeah. Any questions? I don't think a single person has a scan QR code. Yeah, that was the point. <laughs> 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 <laughs>